It's uh, wonderful in two years I have been back to Australia twice. Last year to Sydney, but in the middle of the semester, so once finished, I flew back. And this year in Canberra, and uh, uh, two years in 14 and 15, right? After previous time I'm from Australia, is I, in Canberra, I have been the previous time in 1987, and I left Sydney in 1988 after I finished. So I just back twice, two years in a row, after almost 30 years. Uh, the topic I propose today is not actually my current research, but it's, it's part of it. I, I try to come up with a topic which is, I think, uh, more suitable to the audience here, but at the same time, of course, has to be, uh, be part of, the, of the, my interest. This topic it can bridge three or four issues of my interest. Intellectual foundation of modern science as intellectual history I, uh, I'm interested in of the late, 18, late 19th to early 20th century. Second one is about change recently, in recent years, as part of the Association of Asian Studies uh, job maybe, then draw me to my interest to the changing Asian studies and Thai studies. Southeast Asian study as well. And the third, as you know, my uh, half of my uh, life is about politics and democratization in, in Thailand. Even though that half, uh, some people say, uh, some people assume that I can reconcile with the academic one. I won't go to details, but I, I would say that no. Normally I leave it apart. And I think the relationship between the two scholarship and my politics are a bit paradoxical. They're related, they're paradoxical in certain ways, and I think that's the best way to deal with it. So for today, I'm happy to make it clear up front that I'm not going to talk politics. Even though the topic might be breach of that, but I'm not going to talk, not because I want to avoid it. No, I can, I still keep talking about it any, in many places. Uh, I'm not trying to avoid anything, but just, it's just not fun. <laughs> <laughs> For academic, meeting like here, like in you, the size like this, friendly like this, let's have fun. <laughs> Rather than frustrating and having too much happiness and <laughs> <laughs> So I talk about not really not is a Thai word for Thai, educated abroad. This topic seems to be obvious, especially to many Southeast Asianists, people of South, doing Southeast Asia and other countries. But somehow in Thailand, it's not that obvious. If you check how many studies or not really not in particular in Thai, in Thai in English, in Thai exists only in master thesis, as master thesis, I count two. <laughs> if we Define it broadly, then many more, because biography of this prince, that prince, this prince, that king, then there are a lot of things about these people educated abroad. But the subject of not really now in the sense of the subject of people who study abroad and did something based on the fact that they are not really now only two. So not, not an obvious subject. So, <coughs> For me, the talk today, I divide into basically three parts. One, the implication of the adjective knock or the outside, especially for intellectual history, especially because that one I know better, and also I don't think it's applicable, the implication of the term is applicable to every aspect of social relations, but let's say, many enough, I mean, applicable to many aspects of the uh, uh, social relations, the implication of the word not or the outside. Then I come to the second part, I will offer a typology of not really not. By the way, I, the second part, which originally was the main part of the talk, once I prepare more, no, it's not the main part, but one of the three. But uh, I, I, I said it earlier, a moment ago, that it's not my research, just an idea, 
because roughly all three are kind of the second part, which supposedly should be the regional part, the main part, is kind of sketchy. But I think it, I find it, I find myself, I hope for you too, interesting. But it's unlikely that I'm going to produce a big research on that, no. But you see in a moment that, wow, if you're interested, it's free. <laughs> Anybody can, 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 can think about it, and, and perhaps you can produce a, 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 an interesting work of, of, of this kind. Uh, not exactly this subject, but let's say I think it's applicable to many others. And the third part about the changing Thai academia and Asian studies. I attach this just because it's a bit part of my interest. As you see that, it's a bit odd, making the whole thing not quite coherent. But let's say, as a talk, uh, I think you can connect the dot. OK, the first part. Now, as an outside, as a foreign, up and up to a certain point, let's say by the last uh, for the past 100, for about 150 years, NOC in this sense, nuclear NOC, normally doesn't, it doesn't mean, does, people don't think about people who study in China, in Philippines, in Burma, Bangladesh, or India. No, they think about the West. Even though the word itself doesn't imply that, but in the past 150 years, it's had that implication. Okay. Thai society and culture has been in contact with Indic and Chinese civilization for hundreds of years, as you know. To what extent those two places were the outside for uh, in Thai mentality? I put this question aside. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. How much people think about Buddhism as the outside? I'm not sure, because by the time I'm familiar, by the time of historical period of Thailand, they don't think about Buddhism as the outside alien culture anymore. It's the opposite. Is the opposite. You never see a Buddhist image, a face of Buddhist image that look like Aryan people, that look like Indic people. You saw them look like Thai, look like Lao, look like Khmer. So they localize the face, they localize religion. So to what extent they remain uh, Indic, I'm not sure. I put that aside. Jump ahead to modern Thai history. In the past 200 years, particularly intellect, 150 to 200 years, particularly to intellectual uh, culture, uh, it began carrying the particular reference to the West. Though it's not always, not always, but but you know this term, this kind of term, not always well defined. But I believe that I have the uh, my argument is that the effectiveness of this kind of vague term, modern, no. Old time, new time, it's effective because it's vague. It's effective because it's not really well defined. You know, whenever you try to define it, so particularly you find the flaw, you find the holes, you find the gaps. But let's say uh, that doesn't reduce its effectiveness by trying to, to argue for a well defined uh, uh, definition. But let's say uh, in the culture, these terms are effective because it's vague is applicable a bit more widely than it should be. Uh, for the non-Western foreign, there are, the, uh, there, are, there are other terms for such as neighbors, such as tang, pathet, tang, just different. Uh, but they use, don't use like a, a mung nok, nok rien nok. This is the past. Since, since late 19th century, you find this term particularly means the West even though the term itself doesn't mean the West at all. The North or the outside or the West can have and suggest two opposite connotations. One is more civilized, better, especially in terms of material culture. On the other hand, for intellectual, spiritual aspect of Thai society, is alien. And it could be not necessary. It could be bad influence. It could be decadence. It's basically, it's something to learn, but you should not imitate. So those two, those two aspects, I believe many anthropologists here should understand quickly. It doesn't mean those two stay strictly, firmly 
in one place. No, it's a kind of mark the two poles, mark the perimeter of people can think which knob, which knife, which is, should be applicable, which should not. Then the trouble with intellectual history that I have grappled with for years, 20 years, and I grapple and also have fun with is that, in fact, all the problems happen because look, most of the things in human affairs happen to be in the middle, <laughs> such as Pachati Patai democracy is it in or out. You can't say it. The dress is in or out. You can't tell it is in or out. <laughs> A lot, most, 90% of things are both in and out. So then the argument is forever. The, but that's how society evolved, right? That's how many cultures evolve. Let this debate go on. I mean, in both positive and negative sense. Because people often mark the perimeter. Even though the perimeter is also flawed. It's false dichotomy. But society evolved because it allowed the debate to go on in between. It allowed the debate to uh, happen forever. Then some kind, some, most of the time, the conservative version, uh, the interpretation one, sometimes the liberal one. But it depends. It depends. This is how, how Thai society, like many other societies, also grapple with and struggle with what is in and out. Even though the in and out itself is uh, both is the notion that the economy is flawed. So that, this bifurcation, I have uh, written about it as kind of mark of uh, the perimeter in a book. It is by Peter Jackson and Rachel Harrison and Vickers Alu of the West. So that book has many more examples and many articles in there explain uh, uh, Alu of the West much better than my article in that book anyway. Let us uh, say in and out differentiation is e easily applied to make sense or to create value judgment, even, even though in itself the dichotomy doesn't make much sense and make, uh, create, lead, mislead to the, to the poor judgment so many times. Uh, as I say, this is how culture works, as far as I understand as a historian. This is how it, it works. Among the influential ones, in fact, in and now, is among the in, influential ones, uh, is, is among influential frame I mean, we talk about conceptual frame, now we think, try to think about this theory, that, theory, that theoretical argument is a kind of sophisticated thing. Don't you think in and out is a kind of simplified, simplistic conceptual term as well? And in fact, it's so influential and widespread conceptual term because it's so easily understood. Or to put it too precisely, it's so easily misunderstood. That's how it works. So there are a lot of, of famous dictum in Thai which play with the in and out. I raised just one issue, which seems politics, but I call it intellectual history. The idea about democracy in Thailand, democracy. First, we saw it appear in the, in the, in the, in the, in the text, in the late 19th century, the last decade of late 19, the last decade of 19th century, and become a kind of written down in a, a text in 1903. We saw the argument that the, at the time there is no Thai word for democracy; they use it democracy. Democracy is suitable for the society that grow wheat. Thai society eat rice, so be careful because uh, things that go with wheat culture doesn't fit the rice culture. Uh -huh. Of course, the author didn't think about the rice eating people up the mountain, and rice eating people in southern China and many other places. <laughs> no, this is just, that's why it's false dichotomy. But it, it works to warn people that, hey, don't be crazy about democracy, because democracy fits the wheat culture, not the rice culture. That saying has been used so many times. The latest one that I heard is after the coup last year. <laughs> so then, uh, more than 100 years already, that exact argument that this society, we eat rice. It's actually just the past few weeks, right? The, the one of the minister who, who says something against, I don't know against who, the US or the EU thing, saying that, no, if you want to do, I mean, the thing we do is doesn't fit for people who uh, grew, uh, grew up with the wheat culture. 
is different. That, that's the way it in and out. Or, or the general say that call democracy as democracy trap. That's the way they see in and out. Critical to the monarchy, if you're critical to the monarchy, one the normal uh, saying, you wouldn't believe but it's true, it's so widespread, people would say, get out of the country. The good thing is that they won't kill you. But they said, get out of the country. So mean that you didn't have proper right attitude of the monarchy, the place for you is outside. It's outside. The place for you is outside. Because otherwise, you're inside. You should be on trial. So they get out of the country. That's a common saying. Because the country belongs to the king. As an outsider, therefore, I think Andrew is familiar with this, Westerners cannot know Thailand better than Thais. Many Thai people who do Thai study are familiar with this. Uh, even though Australian, I'm not sure it's in the west or in the east. <laughs> yeah, wonderful place. Uh, the, the most wonderful place is Hawaii, because the east of Hawaii is the west. The west of Hawaii is the east. <laughs> Talking about economies, we can play a lot of fun with it. Years ago, even Thai academics are not immune for this. Years ago, when Niti Yashiwong, if I hope you know, a famous influential historian of our current time, in 1982, when he first produced a, a, a kind of breakthrough academic work, not even political, academic work, the response from the conservative scholars, instead of arguing against him in terms of conceptual or factual or his research quality, the argument is framed by saying that Niti relied too much on theory. We rely on sources. Because for them, theory belongs to the outsider. I made a criticism to another scholar years later. I didn't do any theory at all. Argument is just plain criticize his series of books. In fact, the book is on post-colonialism, so I criticize the way he used theory. The criticism I got, he said, oh, don't worry, because Tong Chai always just work on theory. The author said, I work on reality of Thailand. That, that's a kind of the way to apply in and out effectively, even though it's not correctly, but effectively. Then how about Nagli and Nok? Nagri and Nok is an identity. Everybody has so many identities. I'm Sino Thai. I am a male. I'm this. I'm that. I am Nagri and Nok too. So then, when they call you Nagri and Nok, doesn't mean they reduce other identities, but they emphasize or they foreground the quality that you are the, the particular for qualification of a local Thai who have acquired a local Thai who has acquired a foreign element. In other words, that's why the title for today, at least at the minimum, Nagli Nok is seen as interlocutor of the two cultures, or modern cultures, of the two here. Two here doesn't mean only West and East, and West and Thai, you can say that. But I think in particular because the West is also vague, particularly in and out. The two cultures is the in and out. The inside and the outside in the past 150 years mean the Western. But the Western can be vague, can be Scandinavian, German, British, American, or Broad West, Australia too. <coughs> so at this point, I'd like to make a very important note that, in fact, since the mid-19th century, all notable intellectual, influential, notable inter influential intellectuals in Siam, in one way or another, they have to deal with the West. Even though so many of them, majority of them, were not Nagli and Nok. No. That's another point why this notion Nagli and Nok as interlocutors 
Not Leonardo, the one who acquired foreign elements. It's not exactly true because I think so many influential, I talk about if, uh, Thai intellectuals because that, uh, that's my examples most of the time because that's how, how I, know, I know, what I know better, better. Let's say the father of Thai history, Prince Damrong, he's brilliant. As conservative, as flawed as he is, which is normal, but he's brilliant. He's never go abroad. He never went abroad. He was never not really known. But he is more foreign than many local Thais. In terms of his thinking, in terms of his style of, of, of historiography. King Chula, he never went abroad. He went abroad the end, towards the end of his life uh, for tour as a king. But he wrote things that, particular, I, in my view, I don't have time today, mark the break or mark the moment of modernity as opposed to pre-modernity. A few important texts produced by him who was never not we really know. So many more intellectuals of the common origins as well. So in fact, I'd like to mark this point first. In fact, I would say that the whole scene of intellectual change in the past 150 years, one way or the other, to more or less extent, everybody have to deal with West and the inside and the Thai. Everybody were interlocutors in some ways. But in terms of identity, it's more obvious for not really now. It's more obvious for those who went to study abroad. So to talk about uh, those who study uh, abroad or not really now, it's the emphasis on their obvious visible role as a, as a transcultural interlocutor. So, but it shouldn't mislead us that many other people are not interlocutors. In fact, they all are. They may be different, because differences, even among the real now, there's all differences. But this identity is to mark a certain kind of identity, which in itself also misleading, which is normal for identity, everything, anyway. Every kind of identity, is some, to some extent, is misleading. But this is to, to tell you about how, how the real now uh, work. Among the, I give you a few more examples of interlocutors who influential as intellectuals and influential in the terms of West versus Thai, how to deal with it. I, I mentioned King July, I mentioned uh, Prince Damrong, I mentioned a few more such as the famous name people who know Thai history know too, Gosarok Gulab, Tin Wan. Both are so Farang, especially Tin Wan are so Farang. Farang is a term for Westerners. Tin Wan is so Farang. Gosolok Gulab is not Farang. If you know Sulak, I often tease that Sulak is like Gosolok Gulab. Uh, it's a kind of so Thai, but in fact, he's so British. <laughs> Gosolok Gulab is so Thai, but at the same time, yeah, he's a foreigner. He's the first commoner entrepreneur writer. There's no entrepreneur writer even in the West many, many more years after him. So he's, he's a kind of uh, Western in that sense. Live his life by producing, publishing books, which is very fun. Who else in our recent time, people like Suchat Sawatsi, a famous editor and writer, he never went abroad. But his works always introduce foreign art, Western artists and writers to Thai literary world or social, one of socialist thinkers, socialist journalist, socialist writer, Supasili Manon. Supan is not really known. Although at one point he was a diplomat for about a decade. He was posted in USSR, in Switzerland for a while when he was in, in foreign services. But otherwise he was a writer, he was an editor, journalist. So ultimately, in and out are simplistic, but could mislead, but it's useful because exactly because it is effective. So acquiring a degree from the West, acquiring a degree from the West is good. It's international stamp of approval of a local product. People see it positively. But once you behave too Western, and in terms of intellectual history, intellectual influence, once you try to advocate something which is seen too Western, to say that you oh, you are not really enough, it turned to be a criticism, a satire. So the same phrase, oh, you're not really enough, could be admiration because you finished from Harvard. 
you finish from this and that, A and U, whatever. But at the same, exactly the same time, oh, you are not really, no. It's a kind of sign, oh, criticism, that satire that, okay, you are an alien. You bring out the idea that is not suitable here. It goes both ways. It's a kind of subtle different. You have to work it out. That, that's the way it's always worked. For example, the key members of 1932 revolutionaries was called since, his, since their time, since 1932, that, oh, because they are not really not. Hey, King Wachara would also not really not. <laughs> King Rama the seventh, who was ousted, who was overthrown, he was not really not. As a matter of fact, don't you know that King Rama the seventh, the last king absolute monarchy, his lingua franca was English? Yeah. In his day-to-day -day talking, he can talk both in English. And English, he's more comfortable. He's writing always in English. He needs people to help writing Thai. That King Rama the Seven. But people never say, King Rama the Seven, you are not really no. No. <laughs> people say, pretty people, those revolutionaries in 1932, who that overthrow the absolute monarchy, they are not really known. And in the sense of satire, in the sense of stigma, that stigma stick many more decades after that. That's a way to at primarily brand those revolutionaries that they are the outsider, they are the bad elements that in, it ultimately doesn't really fit the Thai environment. There are many more examples. Uh, I mentioned King Wachila Wood, uh, even though he's so British. He's Shakespearean. You know, yeah, and he's, he's, he's quite good too. He's, I have to admire he's quite good Shakespearean. He translates Shakespeare work, even though, or he imitates Shakespeare work into Thai beautifully. Uh, he also introduced the notion of Cha Satsana, Pramahagasa, nation, God, uh, king, uh, God, and nation, right? Uh, into Thai become nation, religion, which means Buddhism, and the monarch, and the monarchy. And you know how powerful that, dict that, that kind of, of ideology is, even to recent years. That introduced by King Wachira Wood because he grew up in England. His thesis is on the Polish succession. Yeah, he wrote a, uh, his, his historian. He wrote a, a, a but he, his career turned out to be a, a quite a good literary person, a great poet, I have to say. A failed monarch, a failed government uh, ruler, but great literary person. So Nuri Anno has been notable agency of uh, in Thai history. Criticism of their roles come in two forms. One, it's too extreme, and I, I introduce another dichotomy which is false but effective. There are two Thai. Not really not. Many of them became still too Thai, as if they never learned anything from abroad. On the other hand, there can be criticism to that. They're too far. Out. They forget their root. Among those two Thai, I have, list, I, have, I have heard very recently, for example, sorry to, to break my rules, go into politics a bit. People talk about former Prime Minister Apisit Vetchatiwa. How come he is Oxford? He doesn't look like learning anything from Oxford at all. <laughs> True or not, that's fine. That, it doesn't matter. But that's the way pe some, many people talk about him because it, he looks like he doesn't appreciate democracy. He doesn't understand democracy at all. That's how people say about him. How come? I mean, it never happened if people who are not, not really now, who, ne who, who never brag about um, the Oxford. No, uh, he, he brag about it. That's, what, that's why people say, OK, you brag about it. How, how come you're not really now, but you seem like you learn nothing from, from, from the West? That, that also. But to, to say that you are too, too farang, uh, you are kind of uprooted from the Thai, Thai root, that looks so common for people who are like me, like many other people who kind of uh, maybe pro-democracy, because democracy is, as I, I said earlier, is, is, is kind of all. No. Now, the second part of my talk, I have to go better, a bit faster now. Then how to make sense 
of those nuclear really knock when I got the email from visit. How to make sense of this? Me too, I struggle with this. Because you can find all variation between the two, between people like uh, uh, Michael Wright, uh, the late Michael Wright, who used to be, uh, he's a British, who, who lived in Thailand for years, he become a great writer, he write Thai, perfect Thai. He called this uh, in Thai, but let's say translate like, those people who never left home, even though they study abroad, <laughs> They call people like people like a piece would fit his bill, uh, who went abroad but never leave home, never leave Thailand. On the one hand, and people who uprooted from from Thai culture. How to make sense of that when they got the email from Visit? How to make sense of this? Because we have so varieties. Uh, I try to urge that don't go to simply two poles or two dichotomy. Then the way to do is the following. I found the book unrelated to Thai or Southeast Asian studies at all. By Todorov, useful. I introduce him briefly and then we move on. Todorov introduced different types of knowledge or different types of approaches to knowing the other. In this case, meaning the Spaniard who went encounter, who encounter, went to the new world and encounter with the native people and then produce memoir, produce encyclopedia, produce all kind of records back to, the, back to Spain uh, in the 100 years after, uh, roughly speaking about 100 years after the, the conquest. In the book, you see all six names. In short, it is a comparative intellectual biographies you understand the words? I hope now you can think quickly. Yes, a comparative intellectual biography of six Spaniards. He never said this word. This is mine. But those six are the following. That's it. The whole book are about six Spaniards. What they write, what they explain, what the kind of knowledge, in fact, what the approach there are particular approaches to knowing the other. They approach the knowing from the first one, turn nativist, to the sixth one, bang the head, kill them, <laughs> because those are variations. So my argument is that in every single situation, you don't produce a single type of outcome. You produce many. On the other hand, it doesn't mean that those many are too much to study. Yes, you can study. If you take the right approach, you apply good methodology, you can study. Or let's say, talking about simple, especially for parents, who people who have kids. I have two kids, two kids brought up in the same way. I never think, OK, they have to take a different approach as a male or female. Just the same approach. They're so different. This is common experience of every parent. Many kids are not the same, even though we brought them up in the same way, we thought that at least. The same thing. Every single situation doesn't produce one. But on the other hand, don't feel despair that it's so, it's, it's so chaotic and so unsystematic that we cannot understand it. At least, we cannot understand it conceptually. No, it's not true. We can. My argument is that we can. My suggestion is that in this way, in a way, type is not a real person. Type are always conceptual tools. Even though those pe six people in total of argument is real people. But in fact, all six at the same time are real individuals, but at the same time are representative of type. In other words, to make it more simpler, simplify the complexity. Yeah, you hear your argument, you hear your, your advice all the time. Complexify your simple argument. Don't simplify it. Don't make it too simplistic. Here, my argument is that simplify the complexity. <laughs> Bring it down into types. But don't be trapped by types. Don't be trapped by your own typology. No. Use typology as a tool to understand 
the vast variation. You can stick particular people to somewhere between three and four, or exactly three, exactly five, somewhere between one and two. Then you have you can make sense better. I don't promise that there are only six. There could be four. There could be eight. I don't know. But think about it. In this way, you can have categories of the insider as well. Of course, it depends on what criteria. In this case, you can see, you just glance, take a, take a quick look. You can see that, uh-oh, I have two criteria in mind at the same time. One is political criteria, from pro-establishment to a radical rabble rouser, <laughs> or, or, or to collab This one is, doesn't fit political, because collaborator can be go everywhere. But I have the second kind of, not neat, but let's say I put in one screen, a kind of, let's say you can have a, I think I have it. No, I don't have. OK, on one hand is a spectrum between pro-establishment, apologies, whatever, to the kind of collaborator. On the other hand, second criteria you can from Sino for to Sino for xenophobia to xenophilia, people who hate the West, people who love the West, that kind of range. It, nobody fit exactly the types, but this is how to make sense of the differences. This is, this is the part that I say, if people are interested, take this idea, develop it in a much better way, I would be glad because I like to understand those complexity of the nuances of, I mean, so in my graduate, I told many people, if this is repetition, is, I'm sorry. My graduate seminar, I always forbid a certain word. You cannot use the word, because we use it too often. The first word is complexity. <laughs> you have to spell it out. <laughs> you can't say complexity, hide behind the complexity. Just spell it out, what is that complexity? The second is nuance. <laughs> You cannot hide behind the word nuance. You have to spare it out. What is the nuance? Which not only students, I myself find trouble many times because it's hard to, to spare it out. So how about Nagli and now? I give you a number of examples. Even Thai, you may not be familiar with this name. Don't worry, especially people who don't know Thai, who don't do Thai study, may not, you don't know this for sure. But let's say I just give you a glance example and go quickly. You can see the range of possible types. In here, I put names on. I put the face on, even though they are types. Even a single person doesn't fit particular type, but let's say that prominent characteristic, he or she is, then I can, I can and you can see this is not a good example. All males, for example, <laughs> so not good. But let's say just a quick look. With Sutisati, and it's not famous name, He's a famous writer in the 40s, 50s. He saw Farang more than Farang. He wear hat, suit in Bangkok. <laughs> and hold cigars and had to and walk like a guess where he studied. Philippines. <laughs> 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 yeah, he studied Philippines. That's why I become so American. <laughs> People like Atensini, our contemporary, uh, you can tell him, but let's say I, he would be stared at me. Sunny, Sunny doesn't know how to joke. <laughs> Atensini, he writes Thai. You don't understand his Thai unless you translate into English. <laughs> but yet, He's a champion of local wisdom. <laughs> and don't tell him that, no, he never understand the local people, no. He would deny it, he would refuse it, but that's how, not just me, many people see him that way. <laughs> a typical technocrat, a lot of them, most of them not really know. Economist, planner, those, you can name them. Then you have untypical technocrat, like boy. Who, are, who is technocrat? Yes, who was technocrat? But untypical in the sense that he, the emphasis he brought in, up to a certain point, he's a technocrat. He's a, he's, a, he's a banker, he's an economist. But up to a certain point, he became kind of advocate for liberal democracy, too politicized in a way. That's why he got into trouble at the end of his life. 
Radical conservative, you know, Sulak. This one you might know more. How about brilliant but not radical? All of these are not really known. For example, this name you might not know. He's an ideologue. He's a regent one time in 1940. I don't remember. And I mix up Buddhist era and, 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 and common era a lot. Let's say in the, in, the, in, the late, in the late 40s or early 50s, he's a regent when, when the king was so young. Rama VIII died. The king was so young, he was a regent. He's a great scholar. Great scholar. In one of his short articles was so influential, which I see uh, that piece as a foundation, ideological foundation, uh, ideological basis of the building of the mon of the current monarch. He wrote it. That piece started with Malinowski. Yeah, that piece started with Malinowski. The importance of magic, importance of sacredness. Then move on to King Rankamhang inscription. <laughs> yep, Malinowski side by side with Rankamhang inscription to lay the groundwork for inter ideology, how the modern monarchy should be built on. Or people like Kirit Pramod, popularizer of modern monarchy, not exactly student of this one, but let's say along the same line of thinking, but he's more popularizer. He's a writer, journalist, and later prime minister. King Wachkara, we mentioned it already. And you can see a pisip, a person, an Oxford graduate who never left Thailand. <laughs> I should put in court. <laughs> not, 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 um, not a statement of fact. No, not a fact. It's just a, a way to, to see. You see the range of this. They also represent certain types. How do I name, how should I name different types? I don't know, I haven't gone that far. I leave it up to you to think about it. Now, the last part and I'm going to finish. This part can be cut off and I finish here, but I, I just love to add it on, so I just do it, indulge myself, adding it on. The point is that, Nugli Nog is a, as a category Nearly now as a category, uh, have been, let's say, have, have a role about late 19th century, mid to late 19th century, up to about, let's say, 1960s. As an identity, people call Nearly not as an identity. Lately, maybe your generation, people don't call that anymore. Why? Because so many people are Nearly not. It doesn't have distinctive value anymore. By 1780s, people, Thai people went abroad a lot and came back in so many professions. So it lost its distinctive value, not because they disappeared, no, because it became common. Not really know in earlier period, their role or their place is not in intellectual, it's not in academia, no. It's in the bureaucracy. Because Thai academia, in fact, started to expand among the first professional full-time academic person was high, were high in the second half of 1960s. If you, count, if you call academia as a kind of community of that kind of professional people, it's very young. But of course, if you call science society, including people in the bureaucracy, who, people who who interested in, in, in intellectual work, uh, even though no matter profession they are, yes, of course, academia have been long, much longer than that. But the, the academia, in the way we talk about, in Thailand, just about the 60s. At the time when the distinctive value of Nong Rien Nok started to dilute. Doesn't mean that Nang Lien Nok play no role, or Nang Lien Nok doesn't do anything anymore, no. But people don't call that because you are Nang Lien Nok, so you have influence in such and such ways. Because everybody is Nang Lien Nok. Let's say most people are Nang Lien Nok, so they don't call it distinctively. But let's say, the reason I put this part in because 
the role, at least for me, not really not many who are educated abroad from now, at least this sector, you go back to academia. Even though I put the first, I put, I, I just said a moment ago, in fact, so the majority of really now, no, they never get to, to the academia. No, they go to other profession and no distinctive value anymore. So this part, to be fair, I'm not talking about the whole really now, I'm just talking about people like you, many Thais here in particular. The point here is that Thai studies, Thai academia uh, is changing. In Thailand, are changing. There's so many ways we can talk about that change. Just for example, one way that I like, I don't want to talk, but it's a huge subject. It's a huge issue. I have no time and I have no knowledge enough. Just talking about the changing and the scale, the size of the academia, the number of university, the number of students, the number of professors in the past 20 years. I don't know, two, four, three, four, or quadruple. I'm not sure. So fast. Just scale alone means a lot, change a lot of Thai academia. But it's too hard to grapple with. It's too hard to, to, to deal with it. So that's why I just, just mentioned uh, in passing. Another thing, another role, is, is, which is not exclusive to, not really not, but, uh, but let's say is a distinctive role to, to Thai intellectuals. Like many other intellectuals in Southeast Asia, at least according to Harry Bender since 1961, intellectuals in Southeast Asia, active one and smart one, usually they are also public intellectuals. Unlike in the West, no. The smart one tend to be in your own home, in your own place. In Thai, the smarter one go public. In Indonesia too, I believe. In 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 Philippines too. Not everybody, but let's say it's common. It's so common. This is also another aspect that I like to talk and I mark it here, cut. Because it's so important, but I don't have time. And it's, uh, but it's not particularly about really not anyway. The part that I like to emphasize as a last part here is that Thai studies are lagging behind, are having trouble. This is my view. I presented this the last year Thai study conference exactly this point because the lack of engagement with scholarship of the outside. Thanks to the falling barrier, maybe not these three, but I can explain these three quickly in short language barrier. When Singapore wants to turn from teaching university from research uh, institution, they do a number of things, but the key one of the key one of a few, not that many. There's so many things they change quickly, fast, radically. But a few things worth important, a uh, key things. One is reduce the teaching load. How they can reduce the teaching load? from five or six down to three. Singapore and US now is three, among liberal arts. They just, they have money first. Not many countries have money. Singapore have money. Second, they do it in English. The teaching done in English. If the Thai have money, they, can, they want to suddenly change the teaching law. Can they do that? No, because they're not meant enough Thai to fill up the positions. Worth it. Or let's say the university would be like, like now, people complain a lot about the quality of the, of the faculty already among the so many places that uh, expanded with the expansion. So it's not as easy because the language barrier. But more important than that, there have been so many Thai, it's so common for Thai scholars, including in social science and humanities, especially in the humanities, historian, literature, people. They can live their life after coming back from abroad. They can live their whole career in Thai. They don't have to have, they don't have to publish in English. Now maybe change, but let's say up to recently, they don't have to publish in English. They don't have to read or follow the journals in English. Many journals are not available anyway. Library, short of budget, library kind of thing. So a lot of people, I would say, typical Thai scholars in Thailand, in humanities, they don't read English regularly. 
So many of them don't read at all. Or read it kind of very sketchily. They don't follow the literature. You can see the peril of that refuse or deny or failure to follow the literature in your field. That happened because language barrier is so common. The solution of Thai administrators by forcing young people like your generation, now on you have to publish in English, in ranked journal. I'm not sure that solved it, but let's say uh, that's one effort. I'm not sure, I think it's misplaced. I think it, it do something bad, but let's say uh, uh, that's, this is not the place to go to that details. It's one condition. Second economy here is not national economy, it's economy of scholarship, meaning demand supply of your knowledge. Demand of your knowledge, most of the time, not the demand in English. Not the, the demand in, in, even not in terms of language. In some ways that you need to acquire the engagement, you need to engage with the scholarship outside. You are fine. You are said you can be self-sufficient in terms of, <laughs> you can have sufficiency knowledge. <laughs> in, in, and then you can operate in the country. And of course, ideology, this kind of knowledge is so alien. So it's out. So those are three barriers result in what I call intellectual protectionism. Whenever you get to intellectual protectionism, the quality tends to go down in Thai intellectual, Thai scholarship as well. This is the first the, the thing I want to do about Thai studies. Uh, then Thai studies become provincialized. The last point of today, sorry if I go a bit over time. Thai studies, that's what's going on. There may be efforts to try to change. Uh, they may be successful, they may be misplaced, all kind of measures that beyond our talk, my talk here. But let's say, put that aside. But that condition is happening at the time when Asian study is changing rapidly and actively in two ways. The second part is my AS presidential address that was published in JS already uh, in the November issue. The first part, I add on it because, in fact, I, 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 my mistake, I missed that. A presidential address, I should add this, but that's fine. The first thing also going on a longer while, maybe longer than this issue. My argument, the first is that Asia in a new environment, let's put it this way to make it brief. Area studies, as we know it, now dominant, influential by the American, not entirely American, but influential by the American. It's built up based on the need of the Cold War. Don't translate too directly that so the work of scholars have to serve the American government. No, things doesn't happen that, that so sim simplistically. No, never. In fact, most of the scholars are good scholars who are critical to the government. But yet, the frame, the way the funding given you is framed in terms of a different area studies as we know it now. That frame is collapsing partly the end of the Cold War, partly the emerging globalized economy, which I think I, ha I don't need to tell you, I don't need to describe, because I can't. I'm not, I don't have expertise in, the, in that way. Both are linked. The end of the Cold War, the globalized economy, both are linked in certain ways. Area studies was affected. Asian studies were affected, at least in terms of, hey, why do we have to define it as Northeast, as Southeast, as South, as China, blah, 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 so on and so forth? Why in particular Southeast Asian studies, we tend to be focused on nation state? By now, you realize that you have read so much work since the 80s, I would say, quite a while ago, since the 80s. Uh, since the 80s, people try to, scholars try to transcend that kind of limit that kind of definition. Conscious or not conscious with a big picture of the changing space, that's fine. But let's say, it's things going on. Now, among the fat, among the fashionable thing is more like transnational Asia, or to make it short, trans-Asia, inter-Asia, intra-Asia, uh, what else? And defining region in so many different ways. 
You might see it as an as a intellectual fun. Yeah, it's a kind of intellectual exercise for fun, but it also has impact, it also has effect. Because it suddenly we started to know, you have the knowledge that Asia or, or different shape, different forms of Asia is possible to know. It's possible to know. It used to be the knowledge that fall into the crack because it doesn't fit the region. But now it becomes the knowledge in full bloom. Suddenly we realize that there's so many ways of defining Asia, especially. And by those, just simply, basically, not simply, just basically by defining the space of Asia differently, you found different knowledge. I saw Ariel, I suddenly think, yeah, Ariel has done this a lot. You define culture studies, popular culture in it, it doesn't fit the region that you do try to fit it. Even though it's produced in certain languages, in fact, it doesn't fit the region that we try to fit it. It cross, it less is more. Whatever, it doesn't exactly fit the region we want. We seem to know this for a long while, even before the 80s, but we didn't do it. We didn't produce the knowledge in act actively in the real way until maybe since the 80s. People like Tony Reid, many other people, or the famous one beyond Southeast Asia, like Ken Pomeranz, like Sanjay Subramanyam. Those people, those work, those kind of work are important. And I, I say it almost sarcastically as fashionable. That's not fair to them. I have to say that I love those works. It's so important. I'm not capable of doing it, but let's say it's important, it's coming, like it or not. Asia is changing. Do people in Thai studies aware of this? Do they want to engage in what way they can and they should engage? I am happy or unfortunately I'm unhappy to report that I don't think this has become an agenda inside Thai academia yet. It has been for Thai people outside, yes. Andrew, Peter, I can saw the face. We know of this, but it hasn't been an issue much in Thailand. Things have changed. My last, last of the last point. The size of production of Asian studies is also changing. Meaning, meaning the following. One of the privilege of the being president of the AS is going around the countries to see people who do Asian studies in the region. Many of them never show up in the annual meeting because they, they always fail to get their proposal accepted. Or so many of them are graduate students. A few places, including undergrad. The privilege gave me the, let, the knowledge that uh, confirm my speculation, but confirm even though there's no statistics. The number of faculty of scholars in Asia in Asian studies, I mean, who teach courses and do research on Asian studies in the US right now, rapidly, rapidly change the demography. They are Asians. They are Asians. Think about Edward Said when he's talking about Orientalism as the study of the other. Do you think those people study Asia as the other? Maybe not their insider. Maybe they were denied. Maybe many of them are like me. Maybe they are in between people like me. But let's say definitely, I never studied Thailand and like the author. It may be the other of me in certain way. <laughs> but they're not the other in the sense of the West versus the East, like Saeed suggests. Area study for those people who become, I wouldn't say majority, they're not yet, but let's say the number increased fast in the past, I don't know how many years, but not beyond 20 years. So many faces like me teaching courses in Asian studies everywhere in the US. Students too. Many Chinese students take courses in Chinese history. Not that they know well, some they don't know well, some thought they know well. And it has effect from the fact that they know better to the fact that, in fact, they don't know much. <laughs> yeah, I have a good example I put in my article in the JS. One of my colleagues have trouble, have so many Chinese. Then they accuse the professor, who is American, that, uh oh, this, this Chinese, 
his Chinese history is so different from Chinese history that they know. <laughs> you can't imagine what kind of Chinese history they know. <laughs> and they accuse the professor of, no, you don't know enough. <laughs> the way my friend have to adjust, have, have, to, have to tackle this issue, of course. Have to deal with it. You can't deny it. Because in that class, the majority happen to be Chinese. <laughs> So this kind, of, this kind of news, this kind of information, not rumors, happening fast, increasingly. On the other hand, this December, the first conference of Southeast Asian Studies by consortium of Southeast Asian Studies, right? Southeast Asian Studies everywhere pop up fast in Southeast Asia. They may try, even let's say Singapore, they may want to be Cornell, they may want to be Harvard, whatever. But in the end, consciously and not consciously, they will find that they have to find their own identity. That would take time, but that will happen. Asian studies produced in Asia would eventually, I don't know how long, have their own characteristics. I don't mean it's good, I don't mean it's bad, I really don't know. For example, if it happens today, right now, it will become policy-oriented and market-serving <laughs> a lot of them. I don't like that, of course. But let's say, don't you think colonial age area studies or American area studies started the same way? Yeah. Starting by trying, making a lot of mistakes. Asian studies overall are moving towards Asia. I'm not saying that America is going over. No, when people say, so America is over, right? I ask them, do you think British education, British university all gone bad? You don't go to Britain anymore? Not true, right? <laughs> so it's not that easy. But suffice to say that Asian studies in Asia, especially in China, is becoming forceful. Like it or not, that's happening. Then, last, last, last point. Think about Thai academia that you have, many of you here have to go back and spend your career with. What kind of Thai academia you would want to produce, you would want to share in 10, 20 years from now in the environment of Thai studies, as I told you, in the environment of Asian studies, as I just told you. I'm not sure that I'm 100%. I'm sure I'm not 100% correct. But this is just a broad trend. Think about it. How long, how more you can avoid or you can let the situation that the inadequate engagement with the outside world, outside scholarship going on. If you can't, what to do? At the institutional level, and down to your own individual level. How would you do the engagement? Then back to the original issue, I start this talk. To what extent, or in what way, what type of nuclear now you want to be <laughs> among those five or six? <laughs> or let's say if you happen to be, you didn't try to, you don't have a kind of design, but you eventually happen to be certain ways, Make sure you're aware of who you are, what approach you take. In the end, what kind of not really know you want to be or introduce to Thai academia. Sorry, it be too long. Thank you. <laughs>